on Visenya's hill, an army of whores bestowed their favours freely on any man willing to swear his sword to game and power her. While at the river gate, Sir Perkin feasted his gutter knights on stolen food and led them down the riverfront, looting whatever and wherever they wanted. Even as Wat the Tanner led his own mob of howling ruffians against the gates of the god, though King's Landing boasted massive walls and stout towers, they had been designed to repel attacks from the outside, not from within the walls. The garrison at the Gate of the God was especially weak, as their captain and a third of their numbers had died. Those who remained, many wounded, were easily overcome. Wart's followers poured out into the countryside, streaming up the King's Road behind Lord Caltegar's rotten head. To where? No one knew. Not even Wat seemed certain. Before an hour had passed, the King's Gate and the Lion's Gate were open as well. Three of the seven gates of King's Landing were now open to Rhaenyra's foes. The most dire of these threats to the Queen's rule proved to be within the city. At nightfall, the shepherd had appeared once more to resume his preaching in Cobbler's Square. The corpses from last night's fighting had been cleared away, but not before they had been looted of their clothes and coins and other valuables, and in some cases, their heads as well. As the one-handed prophet shrieked his curses at the vile Queen in the Red Keep, a hundred severed heads looked up at him, swaying atop tall spears. The crowd, accepting Eustace's claims, was twice as large and thrice as fearful as the night before. Like the queen they so despised, the shepherd's lambs were looking to the sky with dread, fearing that King Aegon's dragons would arrive before the night was out. With an army close behind them, no longer believing that the queen could protect them, they looked to the shepherd for their salvation. But that prophet's answered, When the dragons come, your flesh will burn and blister and turn to ash. Your wives will dance in gowns of fire, shrieking as they burn, and you shall see your little children weeping, weeping till their eyes do melt and slide like jelly down their faces, till their pink flesh falls black and cracking from their bones. The stranger comes, he comes, he comes to scourge us for our sins. Prayers cannot stay his wrath. No more than tears can quench the flame of a dragon. Only blood can do that. Your blood, my blood, their blood. Then he raised his right arm and jabbed the stump of his missing hand at Rhaenys' hill behind him, at the dragon pit, black against the stars. There the demons dwell, up there, fire and blood, blood and fire. This is their city. If you would make it yours, first you must destroy them. If you would cleanse yourself of sin, first must you bathe in dragon's blood, for only blood can quench the fires of hell. From ten thousand throats a cry went up, kill them, kill them. And like some vast beast with 10,000 legs, the lambs began to move, shoving and pushing, waving their torches, brandishing their swords and knives and other cruder weapons, walking and running through the streets and alleys towards the dragon pit. Some thought better and slipped away home, but for every man who left, three more appeared to join these dragon slayers. By the time they reached the Hill of Rainies, their number had doubled. Atop Aegon's high hill across the city, Mushroom watched the attack unfold from the roof of Magor's Holdfast with the Queen, her sons, and members of her court. Night was black and overcast, the torches so numerous, it was as if all the stars had come down from the sky to storm the dragon pit. As soon as word had reached her that the shepherd's savage folk was on the march, Rhaenyra sent riders to Sir Balon at the Old Gate and Sir Garth at the Dragon's Gate, commanding them to disperse the lambs seize the shepherd and defend the royal dragons. But with the city in so much turmoil, it was far from certain that these riders had won through. Even if they had, what loyal gold cloaks remained were too few to have any hope of success. Her grace as well as commanded them to halt the black water as it flows, Mushroom said. When Prince Joffrey pleaded with his mother to let him ride forth with their own knights and those from White Harbour, the queen refused. If they take that hill, this one will be next, she said. We need every sword here to defend the castle. They will kill the dragons, Prince Joffrey said, anguished. But the dragons will kill them, his mother said unmoved. Let them burn. The realm will not miss them. Mother, what if they kill Tyrax, the young prince said. The queen could not believe it. They are vermin, drunks and fools and gutter rats. One taste of dragon flame, and they will all run. At that, the full mushroom spoke up, saying drunks they may be, but a drunken man knows not fear. Fools, I, but a fool can kill a king. Rats, that too, but a thousand rats can bring down a bear. This time, Queen Rhaenyra did not laugh, bidding her fool to hold his tongue or lose it. Her grace turned back to the parapets. Only Mushroom saw Prince Joffrey go sulking off, if his testimony can be believed, and Mushroom had been told to hold his tongue. It was only when the watchers on the roof heard Sirax roar that the prince's absence was noticed, that it was too late. No, 
the queen was heard to say, I forbid it, I forbid it. But even as she spoke, her dragon flapped up from the yard, perched half a heartbeat atop the castle battlements, then lurched herself into the night with the queen's son clinging to her back, a sword in hand. After him, Rhaenyra shouted, All of you, every man, every boy, to horse, go after him, bring him back. He does not know, my sweet son. Seven men did ride down from the Red Keep that night, into the madness of the city. Munkin tells us they were men of honour, duty bound to obey their queen's command. Certain users would have us believe that their hearts had been touched by a mother's love for her son. Mushroom named them Dolt and eager for some rich reward, too dull to believe they might die. For once, it may be that all three of our chroniclers have the truth of it, at least in part. The Septon, the Maester and the Fool do agree upon their names. The seven who rode was Sir Merrick Manderley, the heir to White Harbour, Sir Lothar Lansdale, and Sir Harold Drake, Knights of the Queen's Guard, Sir Hammond of the Reeds, called Iron Badger, Sir Giles Ironwood, an exiled knight from Dawn, Sir William Royce, armed with a flamed Valyrian steel sword, and Sir Geldon Good, Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard. Six squires, eight gold cloaks, and twenty men at arms rode with the seven champions as well. Many singers have made many songs of the Ride of the Seven and many tales have told us of the perils they faced as they fought their way across the city, whilst King's Landing burned around them and the alleys of Flea Bottom ran red with blood. Songs are sung of Prince Joffrey's last fight. Some singers can find glory even in the privy, Mushroom tells us, but it takes a fool to speak the truth. Though we cannot doubt the prince's courage, his act was one of folly. We should not pretend to have any understanding of the bond between dragon and dragon rider. Wiser men have pondered that mystery for decades. We do know, however, that dragons are not horses to be ridden by a man who throws a saddle on their back. Syrax was the queen's dragon. She'd never known another rider. The Prince Joffrey was well known to her by sight and scent, a familiar presence whose fumbling at her chains excited no alarm. The great yellow she-dragon wanted no part of him astride her. In his haste to be away before he could be stopped, the prince vaulted onto Syrax without the benefit of a saddle or a whip. His intent, we must presume, was either to fly Syrax into battle, or more likely, to cross the city to the dragon pit and his own Tyrex. May perhaps he meant to loose the other pit dragons as well. Joffrey never reached the Hill of Rainies. Once in the air, Syrax twisted beneath him, fighting to be free of an unfamiliar rider, and from below stones and spears and arrows flew at him from the hands of the shepherd's blood-soaked lambs, maddening the dragon even further. Two hundred feet above Lee Bottom, Prince Joffrey slid from the dragon's back and plunged to the earth. Near a juncture where five alleys came together, the prince fell to his bloody end. He crashed onto a steep pitched roof before rolling off to fall another 40 feet amidst a shower of broken tiles. We are told that the fall broke his back. The shards of slate rained down about him like lives, as his own sword tore loose from his hand and pierced him through the belly. In Flea Bottom, men still speak of a candlemaker's daughter named Robin, who cradled the broken prince in her arms and gave him comfort as he died. Mother forgive me, Joffrey supposedly said with his last breath, though men still argue whether he was speaking of his mother, the queen, or praying to the mother above. Thus perished Joffrey Valarian, Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the Iron Throne, the last of Queen Rhaenyra's sons by Lenor Valarian, or the last of her bastards by Sir Harmon Strong, depending on which account you believe. The mob was not long in falling on his corpse. The candlemaker's daughter Robin, if she's ever existed, was driven off. Uters tore the boots from the prince's feet and the sword from his belly, then stripped him of his fine bloodstained clothes. Others, still more savage, began ripping at his body. Both of his hands and feet were cut off, so the scum of the streets might claim the rings on his fingers. The prince's right foot was hacked through at the ankle, and the butcher's apprentice was sawing at his neck to claim the head. When the seven who rode came thundering up, there amidst the stinks of Flea Bottom, a battle was raged in the mud for possession of Prince Joffrey's body. The Queen's knights at last reclaimed the boy's remains, saving his missing foot, though three of the seven fell in the fighting. A Dornishman, Sir Giles Ironwood, was pulled from his horse and bludgeoned to death, while Sir William Royce was felled upon by a man who leapt down from a rooftop to land upon his back. More grievous of all was the fate of Sir Geldon Good, attacked from behind with a man with a torch who set his long white cloak afire. As the flames licked his back, his horse reared in terror and threw him, and the mob swarmed all over him, tearing him to pieces. Only twenty years of age, Sir Geldon had been Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard for less than a day. Even as blood flowed in the alleys of Flea Bottom, another battle raged around the dragon pit above, atop the Hill of Rainies. <laughs> <laughs>